Oh. I'm uh, Daniel's dad. Hey, what else I do here is I, uh, when I semi-retired some years ago, they relieved me of all administrative responsibilities. And we're all glad about that. <laughs> and I just, I, get, I do people now. And I, uh, if you would like an appointment, I have done uh, counseling over 50 years of ministry. Uh, individual, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, loss, uh, couples, marital, family. Uh, so if you would, if you feel like that it would be good that you sit down and have somebody listen to you and uh, maybe share some things that would be helpful, some tools, some uh, bedrock basic things, uh, just email counseling at uh, theorchardlife.com. And I do know my lane, and if you come to me with a problem or difficulty that I really know that that's not for me, I know how to refer. I've learned a lot of people in the area that I can refer to. So do that. But one, one other thing. You may notice that when I'm not preaching, sometimes when I am, that there's this guy kind of stalking the aisles. And you thought, who is, who is that guy? Did the police know he's here? Well, it's me uh, because I'm a pastor. And Lee, you know I love people. And I believe that every Sunday morning, all of you should have at least a look, a smile, a touch, or maybe a word. So it's not weird, not creepy. Uh, I just, I love each one of you. It's not a congregation. It is uh, people who make it up. So I'm glad you're here. And uh, last week, we looked at Love God, Love People. And uh, we're going to do that again from a little different perspective this week about what it feels like to be loved. Have you ever been loved well? Uh, what does it feel like when somebody loves you? Wow. I tell you what, in middle school, that just fires your rockets exactly. Well, and as you grow older, too. It feels so good to be loved. Now, let, let's just, let me just ask, not your family, not romantically. If you've been loved well by someone who makes you feel better about yourself. Now, what I'm saying is that you've got an automatic self-esteem burst. Feel better about yourself. If you have been loved well by someone uh, like that, what are some words to describe how they did that? How, how was, what was that love like? What did they do? What's that? Time. time. Spend time with you. Well, listen to you. Affirmed you. How about here? We've got some people in the middle, I bet, that know some answers. What's that? They cry with you when it's appropriate. Yes. What else? Compassion. Aren't you, you know, all of us probably right now, you're probably thinking about that person who loved you well. Unfortunately, that person is not uh, here on earth anymore for me, but uh, the love that I felt from Lewis uh, continues to, uh, to lift me up. How cool would it be if someone wrote your name down as that person who loved them well? You see, that's what we're, that's what we're after. It's what we're looking for. If we have a whole church full of people who are noted for loving well. Now, we got the T-shirt that says, love God, love people. I've got only two today. Well, I've got, oh, wait a minute. What's that? There's a model for this one. Oh, she got one. Uh, this one says Declan. Where's Declan? Could you bring Declan up here? It's his first time to come to church. <laughs> oh, wow. We're so glad you're here, Isn't it, Paul, Sarah. So happy for you. Uh, I've got a large and a small of this. A large and a small. Rhonda, what do you want? Okay. There you go. Why don't you wear it in good health? Okay. Now, when somebody asks you what that means, what are you going to say? You're going to say, I got that at church. <laughs> I'm not sure what it means. Go ask the pastor. <laughs> I've got um, one more. Love God, love people, love milk. Up to a 12-month-old. Who wants this? Who is that back there? 
You have a baby? Your brother? Oh, look, what's, what's your baby's name? Elena. You got to bring Elena right here where everybody can see. Don't you love babies? Frosty even loves babies. Oh, Elena. I want to see a picture. <laughs> Anyway, the love of God, love people. We can only get so much on a T-shirt, but it comes from Matthew 22. Let's put that up. It's called the Shema. Jesus was answering questions. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together and plotted. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And there were 613, and Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, adds in Luke. This is the first and greatest commandment. And everybody's like, he said, well, oh, yeah. And then he goes on. And the second one is like it. Hey, wait, wait a second, buddy. We asked for one, the greatest. You're giving us two. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two. We saw last week, if you, if you weren't here last week or didn't get it, please go online because it will prepare you and uh, you know, fill you up for this week. Love your neighbors yourself. Now, loving your neighbors yourself is a truism. You, you really have no other choice. You can't love other people better than you love yourself. I mean, think about it. If you don't feel good about yourself, are you going to be all out there loving other people? Probably not. Or if you feel too good about yourself, are you going to love those low lowlifes out there? Probably not. Here's another thing. You can't love other people better than you love yourself. You can't let other people love you better than you love yourself. Have you ever got a positive compliment and you said, oh, no, no. Because you know what lurks within. You can't let others love you more than you love yourself. Oh, there's one other thing I want to tell you today. This is hilarious. In the Old Testament, there are three passages that start with, you shall love. You shall love the Lord your God. You shall love the neighbors yourself. The third one is in the same chapter as the love your neighbor one. Let me read it for you. This is written to the Jewish people in the promised land. It says, verse 33, I don't have it for the, the screen. When an alien or an immigrant lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as you love yourself. For you were once aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, this isn't political. Love the immigrant as you love yourself. <laughs> wow. I just leave that one there. All right. So we looked last week at a diagram. Uh, who remembers the? Well, it's in your uh, note page. There was a diagram with an arrow that goes up, an arrow that goes that goes to God, an arrow that goes horizontal to love the neighbor. So, what if all we have were just one arrow? Just the demand that you love your neighbor. And so all you've got is just all you've got is just who you are when you're going to try to do that. All your hurts, fears, experiences, you got some good stuff. I'm not saying it's a bust, but I'm just saying if all you've got is just you, nothing else, no other resource, uh, you're going to love people pretty much as you love yourself. Non-negotiable. But what we know is we have an arrow, love your, Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But today I'm going to disclose another arrow and something so meaningful that will enable you to love yourself appropriately, which is going to expand your ability to love others. That other arrow is the one that comes from God to you. Get, of these three arrows, which one came first? 
the downward arrow. Isn't it great that God didn't just in a vacuum say, uh, I'm God, love me. Oh, no. God has shown his love. I think he's shown his love by, in nature, things are in color, not just black and white. I think he shows his love because there's tacos. I mean, there, <laughs> food, food tastes good. I mean, what if we just kind of filled up like a car? <laughs> I, I think God has shown his love in so many ways. But you see, uh, in this passage, uh, this is in um, Deuteronomy 6, 5. So you know there's five, four chapters that come before this one that God has been saying something. And, it, and Deuteronomy is, uh, is it the first book in the Bible? Which book is it? The fifth book. So there's five books in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy, five chapters where God has shown his love for people. As you just saw, I, I have delivered you out of bondage. If somebody were to rescue me from slavery, I, I, w I would think that was pretty good love. And took me and provided for me, uh, took me out of that land, through the land, over and gave me my own land. You see, when God was doing this, he was demonstrating his love for people. All the way. We know that he loves us. We need his love so that his love permeates our hearts and we love ourselves. That way we can love others appropriately. So why is it that we don't love ourselves more? Well, one reason is we have this inner critic. We have this little voice that comes to us. And if you were to walk up here and trip and fall and <laughs> getting on the stage, you'd hear this voice, what a klutz. You're such a loser. Can't you get anything right? And it sounds like me. It sounds like my voice. Or it sounds like my parents. You'll never amount to anything. Or a teacher or a coach. And it's not something that is so loud that shouts at us so much, but it is there. It is an ongoing commentary that speaks into our hearts. And so when someone tries to compliment us, we're like, well, I know the truth. And I don't think I'm really deserving of what you're saying. Have you ever tried to compliment someone? And they, oh, shucks. If, if, you've, if you've ever gone to real churches where they have people that sing solos, uh, I grew up Baptist, and so every Sunday there was a solo. So you often go up to someone who's performed at church and say, oh, that was just a wonderful song. Thank you so much. What do they usually say? It's not me. It's Jesus. And, and we ought to respond and say, well, you know, Jesus sings a lot better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Deflect a compliment. How about just saying thank you? Thank you. You know, being loved by another human being, no matter who it is or how well, can never sink so deep in our hearts that it diminishes that inner critic, that it gives us that sense of being well-loved. There's only one source, only one source, and that's the creator of the universe who has identified himself as love. In John 3.16, this verse on the screen, and you can, all, you can say it with me. You probably have heard it. For God so loved the world, me and you, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God's love. I, I, I observed last week that uh, two-thirds of the planet's population do not believe in a being, a divine being, who is capable or desirous of love. I mean, check it out. It's hard to feel lovable toward an impersonal force or power or like an ocean. It's, it's hard to feel that way. It is so incredible that God has revealed himself in his word as a loving, lovable God. 
Does that sound funny even when I say it? A lovable God. And yet that's how he revealed himself to us. He loves us. It's intimate. Loving God. Loving people. We need to feel his love so much that we have an overflow to be able to love others as ourself. When God revealed himself to the, uh, the Jewish people, he took them out of slavery, took them uh, across the land. Mount Sinai, Moses finally said, you know, I love doing this, but I've never seen you. Could you kind of show me yourself? I'd love to see what, what it's like. And so in Exodus, we're told that God passed in front of Moses we got that one? Proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Oh, wow. If I, I go, whew, man, I'm glad to hear that part. Uh, I have no idea believing God is all powerful. But when he reveals himself, he's gracious, slow to anger and loving. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because... He first loved us. He started it. Our love is a response to his love, to the love that he's demonstrated throughout Scripture. In Romans 5.8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Did you know Jesus died for you on your worst day? Not when you got all cleaned up and came to church and sang a song. He died for us when we were in rebellion against him. We didn't want any God telling us what to do. He died for us at that point. And then 1 John 4, 7. Now, one reason I'm giving you these scriptures is I want to whet your appetite. I want you to hear these scriptures, these passages where God reveals himself, and he's described. And I want you to begin to open your heart to hear it. How would you be different if your heart opened and you heard God say, I love you so much. You're my beloved. What we're doing here, we're beginning to look at the evidence. We're beginning to open our hearts so we can hear him say his love. In 1 John 4, 7, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That's the way we love. And then 1 John 4, 9, just down the page, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him, might live through him. This is love. Not so much that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If Jesus Christ, son of God, came and died on the cross for you so you could live and be reconciled to a relationship with God. How much does God love you? As much as he loved Jesus. Isn't that astounding? But John 17, it says just that. Father, love them as you have loved me. I'm up for some of that. Love them as you have loved me. Now, the Greek word used for love especially God's love in the New Testament, is agape. <laughs> Let's all say some Greek together. Agape. There you go. And, and you've heard of erotic love and uh, phileo, which is Philadelphia brotherly love. Storge means the love for a parent, for a child. Agape means a bountiful, sacrificial love that seeks the best for the one who is loved, unconditional, tender, fierce, protecting, enriching, transformative, redeeming, rescuing. Would you like some of that kind of love? Yeah, we would like some of that. It empowers us. I wish I'd known this in middle school. I mean, in seventh grade, if you knew that the creator God loved you and adjudicated you as worthy of his love, having incredible worth and value and being loved, when that other kid said you were a dork, it wouldn't have bothered you that much. And you're like, well, you know, you look kind of like a dork, but God says he really loves me. And, you know, I'm sorry to call you that. You can love back that way. You see, when God showed his love for us, when he filled us, 
with his love. So it overflowed. He gave us a new mission and purpose in life. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you have a mission. You are called to a purpose. And that purpose is that you love others as he has loved you. This week, if you're thinking, well, I don't have anything to do. Well, go find somebody and demonstrate them the kind of love that you have felt that has registered in your heart as love for you. So how do we receive his love? Okay, I'm going to go through a couple of things, but the question I'm going to answer is, I often hear, why can't I feel God's love? I don't feel God loves me. That's where we're going. We're going to get there because I've got to build a little foundation for it. But that's the question we're going to answer today. All right, first of all, the way that we feel his love. As we read the Bible, as we hear that Jesus loved us and died for us, we respond appropriately to that love. We, we respond when we hear that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We respond by saying, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, for suffering the punishment for my wrongdoings. Thank you for loving me. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Fill me with your spirit. You just get saved. And, and I have to tell you, unless you've come to that point where you put your faith and trust in Jesus and gotten saved, you're not going to be able to hear his love as intimately because it's an inside deal from then on by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Bible tells us that he loves us from inside by his Holy Spirit. And so what we do is we have come to believe in him. We begin to soak in his word. We begin to, to read God's word. We begin to get our Bibles out. Uh, it used to be that people would uh, have daily devotionals. They would have their Bible out somewhere, maybe kitchen table somewhere in the house. Every morning they would sit down and they would read some of God's word. They would feed their souls. But, but we've got TikTok now and social media. I mean, we've got uh, uh, America's Funniest Home Videos. And, uh, and, and well, dang, the, the NFL draft was over the weekend. I mean, how are we going to have time, you know, for God's word when they're drafting guys of NFL? Some of the wives are like, oh, gosh, I wish he hadn't said that. So we want to get in his word because it's through understanding his word, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, that we come to have that solid apprehension of his love for us. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Okay, if I was dead and somebody made me alive, I would be appreciative. I would love that. He made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. So he's given me new life. His love has given me new life. I soak in his word. I do the daily devotional thing. I would challenge you. Get a paper Bible. Get a study Bible. Find a place in your house. Put it there and decide, I'm going to meet God. Put it in your phone as an appointment every day, this time, at least 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to feed my soul. Now, hopefully Sunday morning is a banquet for you. But it... Tuesday afternoon, like by 1.30, I mean, you're going to be feeling spiritually weak because it doesn't last that long. You've got to feed yourself in his word. Have a time in his word at your house, uh, opening it up because when you do that, as you go through the Bible, you see what he said, you see what he's done, you hear his word, you begin to recognize his voice, to hear what he sounds like. And that way you can't be misled in the news every once in a while, we hear about somebody who says, well, God told me to kill him. Oh, you'll know. That's not God's voice. You need to tune your heart to his voice. Listen to his voice. Invest your time. Examine. Understand. So that the Holy Spirit can speak. And you know it's the voice of God, your Father. I love you. You're my beloved. We wouldn't be in Colorado if it weren't for knowing his love and voice. See, we were in New Mexico, 
I was in that vaulted city called Clovis, Clovis, New Mexico, that many people have preferred over Hobbs, New Mexico. Bill, <laughs> we were, oh no, I got it wrong. We were in Hobbs at the time. <laughs> we, we really were. I was on staff at the church there. And so Rebecca was eight months pregnant. You're not going to listen to God's voice to pull, pick up and move to Colorado when your wife's eight months pregnant, right? But we were invited to come up to the valley to consider coming. And we heard, I can tell you, Rebecca would not have been willing to move at eight months pregnant if she wasn't solid in God's love for her and could trust him. So here we came. And we started church at Redstone and uh, just loved it there. Raised our kids there. Our parents came to visit there. But after a while, we built this building, and it filled up, and we had to do something to find more room. So we started Church of Carbondale. And one of the most difficult decisions Rebecca has faced is leaving Redstone, our home there where we raised our kids. And I told her, I, I believe God's calling us to Carbondale to, uh, to start a church. And, and she wasn't really there. And I said, look. Take your time. We're not going anywhere until you hear from God. And we're together in this. And so after a while, she said, yeah. But she couldn't have made that decision without knowing God's love, could she? Or having trusted. So there wouldn't have been a church at Redstone. There wouldn't have been a church at Carbondale, an orchard, if it had not been for the foundation of God's love. In Romans 5, 4. It says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through his Holy Spirit who has been given us. Why can't I feel that love? Let's step back a second. I want to look at what we usually say when we talk to God. Here's one of the most repeated prayers. God, get me out of this. I can't believe you let that happen. Why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you prevent that? We're looking for God's love in our circumstances, that he would protect us, rescue us, prevent. And, and then we pray for loved ones. And sometimes that prayer is not answered. And is, that is disheartening. And so here we are as Christians. We've prayed. We've asked God to do this, to do that. He hasn't. He's disappointed us, didn't answer the prayer. And so we, nice church people like ourselves, would never admit that we hate God or that we're mad at God, right? But inside of our hearts, if we've been disappointed, oftentimes we turn away from God, fold our arms. Have you ever tried to talk to an angry toddler? I don't think we're likely to get many love messages through, although he's pouring them out, if we're like this. You let me down. I'm not hearing it. I believe it's time for us as Christians, as we read his word and see the declaration, proclamation of his love, that we stop expecting him what he, to do what he never promised, which was protect us of all problems. If you read the Bible seriously, how many people that God loved had an easy, happy life? They didn't. Many of them were martyred and beat on and, and left out in the cold. Uh, it's a fallen world, guys, and things happen, and God didn't promise to get us out of everything, but he promised to be with us and to love us. So we reject his gift of being with us and loving us because we expect him to do what he never promised. How about if we put our hands down and we turn around and we say, God, forgive me for turning my back on you. You may need to forgive God. I mean, just for starters, it doesn't really work that way, but sometimes it can feel better. I forgive you that my loved one died. Forgive me for turning my back on you when that tragedy happened. Forgive me. 
In Romans 5, 3 through 5, the first part of the verse that says he poured our love, I want to read this. Um, as entitled, disappointed Christians, these words would never make sense to us. But listen to what Paul says. And he's one of the guys that people beat on and, and ran out of town and uh, threw rocks at him, eventually killed him. But he says, we glory in our sufferings. How many sufferings have you gloried in? We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. When you engage in your suffering, ask for God's wisdom and presence, and he gives you wisdom and guidance in that love, in that suffering, you can persevere. You can hang in there. And that perseverance develops character. And character develops hope, and that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our heart. What if God's love on an experiential feeling basis was on the other side of you accepting some things that don't go right in your life and not holding God accountable for it? Concept. It certainly worked for Paul. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. I don't know if we're going to be doing that. We want to be able to open our hearts. Are you, fe are you feeling now just kind of a, maybe a little crack? Are you feeling, well, you know, I never really looked at it that way. My prayers aren't usually, God, show me your love. No, I look for something more immediate, more circumstantial. But your prayer can be, God, I know you love me. I need to experience it. I want you to love on me. I want to receive it. A verse may come to your mind. A whisper. We used to have a ministry here uh, called Sozo. And it was an opportunity. We had a team of two or three people. And they would uh, sit with someone who had requested an appointment. Listen to what's going on in that person's life, their hurts and fears and how they feel about God. And at some point, after a lot of tender love, environment of prayer, one of the team members would say, okay, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to say this out loud. Depending on whether you mainly pray to God the Father or Jesus or Holy Spirit, Father God, what do you think of me? And then listen, don't discount the thoughts that come to your mind. I remember I was that person sitting there. <clears throat> I don't know if ever, I went to seminary, but I don't know in my life if I'd ever asked God what he thought of me. Does that sound dangerous? <clears throat> you know, I think you're going to get a spanking. I heard, Doug, you're my beloved son. And then he spoke with me about some things in my life. He said, I've always loved you. I've always wanted to reach you and touch you with my love. Jesus, what do you think of me? I heard one time, Doug, you're, you're a warrior. And I didn't feel like a warrior. I felt like I'd let God down so many times. Doug, I see you as a warrior. And then I sit there as that team. But you don't have to be in a sozo session. Uh, we can do it right now. I'm going to ask you to do something. And you're, you can say, you can just move your lips. You don't have to talk out loud. But then will you please just listen, clear your mind and listen. And then write down the first things that come to your mind. I'm going to give you a chance to say it, then I'm going to be quiet and let you listen. I want you to ask right now in your heart, God, what do you think of me?
I trust that many of you heard maybe for the first time, I love you so much. You feel like you're worthless? You're valuable to me. You feel like you failed? I see you in Christ as a winner. I love you. Now, you may have to do this a couple times until you clear the clutter, until you've asked God's forgiveness enough for being angry at something. But I tell you, you will hear. I see people wiping their eyes. I think some of you have received and heard his love for you. Romans 8, 38. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels, demons, the present, the future, no powers, no height or depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Just take a moment, ask him again. God, do you love me? I want to close with this prayer for you that Paul prayed in Ephesians 3. I pray for you that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit deep inside in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with other Christians to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses rational knowledge and be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen.